Today I have a very special guest with us uh, for this program, Ben Stein, who I think most of you have heard of from his writings, from his uh, uh, movie activity, and his humor as a comedian. But he has a new passion to which he has devoted himself in recent times, and that's the issue of intelligent design. And before we get into this conversation, Ben, I just want to remind our listeners of a phenomenon that took place a few years ago in America that shocked everybody in the literary world and certainly in the academic world when this Cornell professor, Alan Bloom, wrote a book that rose to number one on the best-selling list called The Closing of the American Mind. I'm sure you're familiar with I'm it. I'm very familiar with it. I think and it was of course, the, the thesis of that book was that in higher education in this country, there was a systematic closing of any inquiry for ultimate truth. And the way that's played off, uh, out in the last decade or so with the closing of the academic world to any kind of inquiries of intelligent design has been uh, a, a, a tremendous uh, impact to our educational system. And you have produced a film. And the title of that film is Expelled. Is that right? Expelled, no intelligence allowed. No intelligence I didn't produce it. I, I am the narrator and host. It was produced by a very, very smart fellow named Walt Ruloff and two other very smart fellows, but I, I am the, the, I'm the only well-known on-screen tal talent in it. <laughs> <laughs> talent in quotation marks. Well, we were playing around with the staff here before you came in, and I asked them a question that nobody knew the answer to, and I said, anyone? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> made me famous. <laughs> it took about 30 <laughs> seconds to change my life. Yeah, I think your, your uh, audience may, may be interested to know what intelligent design is in the first place. With, with, and it, it is the hypothesis that life did not originate randomly, not by random mutation and natural selection, but uh, that there was some design involved by, all power, by an all-powerful designer. And that uh, we didn't just originate as uh, human beings from lightning striking a mud puddle that there was some design involved. And uh, this, to me, seems so obvious, so intuitively apparent, so compelling, that it stunned me when Walt Ruloff, the producer, brought me evidence that uh, noted academics had been fired, lost their grants, lost their offices, been hounded out of their communities for just questioning the idea that there could have been anything except randomness in the universe. And uh, I couldn't believe that that was really happening in America, but it most assuredly is. Oh, it's there, and it's there with a, a vengeance, as you know perhaps better than anybody right now. And when I look at this, I, I sense a fear from those people of an unwarranted intrusion of religion into the scientific uh, domain. But I think what these uh, academics fail to realize that this issue is not simply a religious issue, it's a philosophical issue of the highest magnitude, and as far as I'm concerned, what's at stake here is the integrity of science itself. You know, years ago I had correspondence with uh, Carl Sagan over the uh, nanosecond to before the Big Bang, and, and he wanted to go back as far as that, and when I would ask him about what happened before that, he didn't want to go there. And yet, in our conversations, uh, he insisted, as he did with his famous TV program and his book by the same name, that this is cosmos, not chaos. And that's the assumption that is the necessary condition for all of science. Because if, if reality is ultimately chaos, then it's unintelligible. And if it's unintelligible, then there can be no knowledge, and that's what science is, is the pursuit of knowledge. Well, you're bringing up a number of uh, issues that are extremely important to the work we're doing and expelled. One is uh, just the question of the universe. If there's, the universe could not exist without laws of gravitation, laws of motion, laws of thermodynamics, laws of fluid behavior, laws of heat flowing to cold. Where did those laws come from? Did those, I mean, we don't just have chaos, we have an extremely precise set of laws that govern the operation of the universe and make life and make even inanimate uh, existence possible. So uh, 
where those come from? That's one thing. A second thing is, uh, if you were to say, well, uh, there was nothing and then there was something, well, how did that happen? How did there, <laughs> how did one day there be nothing and then one day there was something? What, what happened there? And to even ask these questions is so strictly forbidden, you cannot even imagine. And if you were to go to one of these if you were a professor, an assistant professor seeking tenure, and you even asked this question, you'd be out the door. In some circles, it's yeah. certainly true. And uh, it reminds you of what happened in the 16th century with the great scandal with the church during the Com uh, Copernican Revolution, where the bishops refused to look in Galileo's telescope. And we've heard of that mm -hmm. uh, black eye for historic Christianity. But what's often overlooked in that uh, issue was that that was the same posture of the reigning astronomers of the day. Yes. They wouldn't look either because their pet theories were being smashed by the Copernican revolution. And what, see, I think that, but there's yet another, there's the two more issues that you're raising. One is, ultimately, Galileo's views took hold. Ultimately, he was, after some harassment, some considerable harassment, allowed to continue with his work. In today's world, people who question the dominant Darwinian orthodoxy are not even allowed to continue their work. If they want to continue their work, they've got to get out of Dodge and go to a new place and, and do their work there. Second thing, though, is there was no constitution in the days of Galileo or Copernicus. Right. We have a constitution guaranteeing freedom of speech. We have a ga constitution guaranteeing no established religion. If there's freedom of speech, that implies freedom of inquiry. Why can't we have freedom of inquiry? That's a very troublesome question. Second thing is, we do not want to have an established church in this country. I think we all agree that we don't want to have Presbyterian church or the Jewish church or the Muslim church as the established church. We don't want to have the Church of Darwin as the established church either. We don't want to have the Church of Darwin saying you cannot do anything that contradicts any in inference by any neo-Darwinian. And yet that's the church that is dominant in America's colleges and universities. That's frightening. Well, you know, uh, Ben, every scientist has some kind of epistemology, some kind of theory of knowledge. And uh, most of them are reluctant to examine those foundational premises that they use to come to their particular theories. And uh, I remember when I was a, a young student, one of the most important formative books I read was The Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Science. That is, what were the philosophical assumptions that the scientist has to have when he goes into his laboratory? And at the time of the Enlightenment, a whole new way of dealing with things came out called the analytical method, which simply stated was that the task of the scientist is to seek the logic of the facts. In other words, you get the data, you collect the data, observe, experiment, and try to find patterns. What they were looking for was design. Right. And that was what logic was jumping itself. out of them. Logic, logic itself, itself mean, it means, design. Well, the word logic has a Greek root, which is extremely similar to design, and also extremely similar to the English word word. So that, actually, uh, if you go back to the Greek root, in the beginning was the word, means in the beginning there was design, there was a plan. And uh, that seems to be ignored. Well, of course, if you even said that in a university now, you'd probably be shot. But, the, uh, but there, 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 there's a cell. Okay, well, let's go back to that. There's a cell. Einstein had a cell. You and I have cells. My dog has cells. A frog has cells. A plant has cells. Everybody has cells. Everything has cells. A cell is unimaginably complex with hundreds of thousands of moving parts and a huge amount of DNA information in it. If there's information, where'd the information come from? I mean, I'm not saying I know where the information came from. I mean, I didn't see God put the information there. But if it's there, did it come from lightning striking a mud puddle? Did it come from some random chance of one organic matter meeting another organic matter? Is that, is that how, or inorganic matter, is that how the most complex system in the whole world, the system of life itself, came about? That's asking us to believe a lot. 